Every week we release our messages in two different ways. There's the message only version of which this is, or if you want to watch the music, the prayer and the message, click on this button and it will take you right there. Today, we're going to talk about something that's so powerful, it can affect your life very deeply as we talk about bringing our needs before God. See, when we bring our needs before God in the scriptures, we see that's when God so often did miracles in people's lives and changed them. Why can't that happen in your and my life? I think today's message is going to bless you. Well, hello, everybody. It's wonderful to have you with us. I pray wherever you are that you know that God is with you exactly in the place where you are. Now, All of us in our lives, the truth is, is that we can't solve every problem that we have. And for many of us as Christian people, we come to God and we turn to God and we ask God to help us. There are many of us that maybe we don't turn to God all that often, but it's when we hit crises that are beyond us that we kind of throw up a prayer in the direction of God in the hope that, as someone said, the big guy in the sky might do something for me. Well, I want to talk today about how do we ask God for things? How do we ask God to be with us? How do we ask God for the miracles that we hear about, that we read about in the Bible? How do we ask God to do those in in our lives? Because it seems that God certainly wants to do that in our life. My oldest brother, my oldest brother called me one day and it was uh, after my father had been taken to hospital. My father had, was struggling to breathe. He was on oxygen. My father, when he was a younger man, had in his 20s, had worked on a merchant ship. And back in those days, in the, in the, in the 1950s and not late 1940s, uh, merchant ships, he worked in the engine room. And the engine rooms in all where the, all the hot pipes were to keep the heat down, they were wrapped in asbestos, but the asbestos wasn't lined. And what my father didn't know in all the days that he was there is that he was breathing on, breathing in asbestos fibre. And then one day, one day, 10 years before he ultimately died, he came down with pleurisy, an infection in his chest. And the specialist said to him, you're going to have reduced lung capacity for the rest of your life. And then one day I was at work and I get a call from my oldest daughter to say, come quickly, come quickly. I just decided to drop in at, at uh, Pop and Gran, who she used to call them, Pop and Gran's house and, and Pop's fallen on the ground. He can't breathe and the ambulance is on the way. Come as quickly as you can. Well, my father spent time in hospital, a few weeks in hospital. He, he, he lived the remainder of his life with oxygen because something on that day triggered in him. When they realised they couldn't do much for him, they put him into palliative care and they decided that maybe he could go into, he could come home. And on the days before he came, I still remember going around his house and putting oxygen tubes all through the house so that he in his wheelchair, of which the house wasn't designed for a wheelchair, if he was to move around, would at least have access to oxygen everywhere he went. And so dad came home for but a few days. Well, just as my father was coming home, my oldest brother came to me and he said somewhat awkwardly, he said to me, he said to me, he said, we've done all the right medical things, but we haven't done anything, well, spiritual. And my brother was not someone who was necessarily going to church all that often, if to be honest, if at all, for many years, as far as I knew. And he didn't know what to say. And that's why he said it awkwardly. What could we do? And I said to him, well, Rosemary and I and our five children, we've been going over to mum and dad's on the days he's been here, but also into the hospital. And we've been doing what the Bible says. We've been standing around his bed and we've been laying hands on him and we've been praying for him. See, in the, in, the, in, in the church, we're taught, in the scriptures, we're taught that when we lay hands on people, a whole number of things take place from support and love from the power of God that, that resides in us, blessing a person, that we see that laying hands on people can be done in a ministerial way uh, by priests and, and pastors, and it has an authority to it. And it was the way we saw that often Jesus did healing. He laid hands on people. And we're all encouraged to do exactly the same in our own, in our own lives. And so I said to my brother, Rosemary and I and our children, we come and we gather around dad's bed and we pray for him. And my brother immediately said to me, how come I haven't seen you do that? And I said, well, you know, I'm the religious nut in the family, as we all know. 
And I didn't want to be kind of forced on anybody, so we'd just been doing it ourselves. And he said, well, would you do it in front of me if I was there? And I said, sure, no problem. He said, would you do it in front of others, this standing around the bed and the hands thing and the, and, and the prayer? And I said, sure. Well, Dad had come home, as I say, just for a couple of days. And on, on the Saturday, uh, my brother calls the entire family he says, and says to them, we're going to gather at Mum and Dad's house on Saturday night. We're going to have dinner there. And Dad was there. He was in, in his wheelchair, connected up to the oxygen. And he wasn't really just completely aware of everything that was happening at that point in time. And then all of a sudden, I didn't know what my brother was up to, but all of a sudden my brother calls everybody into the long, narrow kitchen that we had grown up as boys in. See, I come from a family of five boys. I have two older brothers, two younger brothers. And here we all squashed in to this kitchen now as grown men with our wives and all of our children and mum and dad. And my brother said, said to everybody, he said, he said, we've done all the right medical things. We can't get any better medical help that's available here than we, than we have for dad. But we haven't done anything spiritual. And the other day I was talking to Bruce and I asked him about doing something spiritual. He said, I don't know what, but I asked Bruce and, and Bruce said, well, Rosemary and the kids, they've been gathering around dad and they've been laying hands on him and they've been saying a prayer. And I, and I said to him, how come I didn't know? And, he, and I said to him, would you do that in front of us? And he said he would. And then I remember my brother looked at me and he goes, he pointed at me, he says, go on, go on, do it now, do it now, do it now. He didn't really know what he was saying. And, and, I, and I remember I said to everybody as they're all in the kitchen and it was highly emotional, this room that we had spent our life in, this little home that was mum and dad's. And I said to them all, welcome to church, everybody. Welcome to church. Because, because in that instance, we had gathered for a spiritual purpose. And while that's not what all the church is about, it certainly is a big component of what the church was about. And I said to them, you know, the question, the question that we have to ask right now is, what do we pray? Do we pray that dad is healed, that dad lives? Because there wasn't one of us in the room who didn't want that. There wasn't one of us. Or do we pray that God's will is done? That, that, that something in us accepts that God may have a different plan. What do we do? And all of them didn't expect to gather at mum and dad's house for, uh, on that night for that question to be asked. And effectively what my brother was saying is, this, I care for dad. But he said he, he, was, he was desperate that dad was dying and dad was leaving. And he was worried about himself. See, often when we pray for people, that's what we're concerned about, isn't it? We're worried about ourselves. We worry about how we're going. And, and that's a completely human and understandable uh, place to be. It's completely, it's a sign of love. Well, we gathered around and we prayed. And as you can imagine, that was just a, an emotional moment that I it's as vivid to me as it was the day I stood there with, with everyone gathered. Well, three weeks later, Dad did die. Uh, how do we ask God for our needs? Because there wouldn't be one of us listening today. There wouldn't be one of us listening today, not one of us, who doesn't in some way have a need for ourselves or have a need for someone we love. Just think of your children if you're a parent. If you're a young person, just think of your future. If, if, you're, if you're someone in a place of authority, just think of your responsibility. If you're someone running a business, just think of your business. We all have needs and they come and they go through life, but we all have needs in our life. Even wondering about security and where we are. Um, see, when we come before God, when we come before God, it's, it's vitally important that we remember this, that when we come to and we ask God for our needs, that asking God for our needs is a spiritually mature, it's a spiritually mature action, just like prayer is or being engaged in worship or contemplation or reflection, that, that asking God's, uh, God's help with our needs is as important as all those other things. Sometimes we fall into the trap of thinking to ourselves, well, 
Well, you know, it, it, maybe it's just a little bit immature to be asking God for, for, for his help. But as a matter of fact, it's fundamental to our relationship with God. Now, if any of you have had children, and I have five children, they're all grown now, but I still remember when they were little, that they would come to me, and particularly when they were very little, is they would come to Rosemary and I, and they would ask for their needs, and they would ask in such a manner as if we could give them everything they wanted. They just they, they felt they had something they needed, and if they got that thing, that was going to help them to be happy. All of us as parents know, uh, or when we take our children to the shops, if we don't train them a little bit, every all the time what we find is they hey, Dad, can I have this? And Mum, can I have this? And can we go here? And can we do that? And it's always about asking, and we have to teach them that not everything they ask, they can get, you know. I was once talking to a, a sales representative at a, uh, that sold children's toys and he said to me, he said, at the shops, he said, we put all of the children's toys at the height they are, at their eye height. So when the parent's talking to someone or talking at the counter, the child is looking straight in the direction of something that would tempt them. And, and, this, and this salesperson said, we call these whinge toys. Well, sometimes we can think that asking God for our needs is, is in a sense a little bit like that. It's a little bit like coming as a child before God uh, and, and, and just whinging to God. And yet that's not true. It is a significantly spiritual action to come before God and, and to put our needs before Him. Have a look at this from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 7, verse 7. And it says, Ask and it will be given you. Search and you'll find. Knock and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives and everyone who searches finds and everyone who knocks the door will be opened. Is there anyone among you who if your child asks for bread will give a stone or if the child asks for a fish will give a snake? If you then uh, who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children in heaven, how much will your, more will your father in heaven give good things to those who ask him? Will give good things to those who ask him. Asking God for things is a spiritually mature thing to do. In, in the scriptures, we read over and over where, where we're encouraged to, to ask God for our needs uh, and, and, and to ask God for, for the stuff we require or we think we require. It's okay. See, when, when effectively we ask God for our needs, effectively we work, we, we, we enter into what we might call worship, the worship of God. And why do I say that? is because often when we go to God and we say to God, God, would you give this to me? God, would you do this for me? Is what we're really saying is, God, I'm at the end of my ability. I don't have the capacity. I don't have the resources. I don't have the knowledge to get this myself. But you have the ability to give this to me. You have the ability to do this to me. I acknowledge my limitedness and I acknowledge the greatness of who you are, that you can that you can. By asking God, we say, I can't do this. I can't do this. I need help in my life. I can't make it happen. Um, but you have the ability. Uh, see, as I said before, often the more spiritually mature we are, sometimes we simply think that it's all about enjoy our relationship with God. It's all about enjoying our relationship with God. But that would be actually a mistake. One of the greatest worships of God that we can bring before God is to bring our needs and to bring our deeper and deeper needs uh, before God. To ask God, if you remember anything of today, if you remember anything, it's this, it's this. To ask is to worship God. It is to, it is to acknowledge Him as Creator and Lord and the Giver of all things. Um, See, asking God for his help is meant to be normal to our life. It's just meant to be normative. It's just meant to be part of our life. Asking, we read the scriptures over and over. We read, when you have needs, bring your needs before God. Bring your needs before God. Now, Jesus, when he taught people to pray and he taught them the Our Father, that prayer on the Sermon of the Mount from, from Matthew's Gospel, uh, when, when, when he was asked to pray and he was teaching on prayer, he gave us a formula for how we are to ask God for prayer. 
And have a look at this in in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 6, verse 9. And I'm going to read from the New Revised Standard Translation, but I'm also going to add the lines in that we more commonly say, like when we go to church and people would say, if we said to a whole group of people, let's say the Our Father, we, we use sometimes some slightly different words. Have a look at this. It says, Jesus said, pray then this way. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Let's just break that down for a second. Have a look at this. It says, our Father in heaven. In other words, when we pray, we, we acknowledge the authority of God. We acknowledge God, the Father, as the one who has the plan. We, not, we acknowledge God that, as it says in the Catechism of the Catholic Church, that out of an act of sheer goodness, God created us, that there's a plan, that God is calling all people into a relationship with Him to share in His blessed life. That's what the Scriptures tell us. So Jesus said, when you start praying, the very first thing to do is acknowledge who God is, who God is. And then Jesus, uh, then Jesus goes on and He says, hallowed be your name. So the first thing we do is the authority of God The second step is the worship of God because the word hallowed means blessed. So so Jesus immediately in these two short lines, he acknowledges the authority of God and the worship of God. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Then what does he say? He He says to the Father, your kingdom come, your will be done. Your kingdom come, your will be done. In other words, Jesus acknowledges Your kingdom, your will is that there's an order, that there's a plan, that there's a way that things are meant to be. And then he goes on and he says, he says, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus says, I want your plan that's in heaven here. I want the way you see your perfect, perfect, infinite plan to be here. So have a look at that. When we pray the Our Father, I'm a Catholic. I go to Mass. I was there uh, yesterday. And, and, and we all stand up and we say the Our Father, this prayer that Jesus taught us. And, and when you've said it a thousand times or two thousand times or thousands upon thousands of times, you can fall into forgetting what you're praying, can't you? Familiarity sometimes is the greatest destroyer of our relationship with God and our experience of God. And we stood yesterday and we said, our Father in heaven, we recognise the authority of God. Hallowed be your name, we worship you. Your kingdom come, your will be done. There is a, pl- there is a way in heaven that you design, God, and I want that way. And your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So immediately we come right out of the gate at the, be- the beginning of this prayer with, with Jesus setting up what we're meant to do. And then Jesus immediately almost takes a right turn. And then because it's the worship of God, he comes and says, now, now let me present my needs, present your needs before God. So we've worshipped God. We've recognised his authority. We've said, you've got a plan. We want that plan. And now Jesus immediately turns to now put your needs before God. What What does it say? It says, give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our, our, our debts. Or as we might more commonly say, and forgive us our trespasses. As we have also forgiven our debtors, and we might more commonly say, as we forgive those who've trespassed against us. And do not bring us into the time of trouble. And we often say, and lead us not into temptation and rescue us from the evil one, but deliver us from evil. There are four major requests here. So after we've acknowledged the authority of God, after we've worshipped God, as we've said, you have a plan, we want the plan, then Jesus says, here's four requests that you make. Four requests you make. Let's break them down. Give us today our daily bread. Give us, in other words, give us what we need today for life. This is a prayer of petition. Jesus is concerned with with people's daily requirements because we all have them, don't we? We all have these daily requirements for our work, our family, our children, our health, what we'll eat today. Jesus is interested in the ordinary. 
Jesus is interested in, in the studies that we do, in the mundane things that we do. He's concerned with, the, with, with who we're in a relationship with. He's concerned with our relationships. He's concerned about the money we have and the needs we have. He's concerned with how we spend it. He's concerned with the clothes that we wear. Give us today what we need. Give us today what we need. So what we say is give us today our daily bread. It's not just about food being on the table. It's about saying, give me what I need for today and you can help me because you have the big picture for my life. Uh, Give me peace. Give me happiness. Give me today what I need for life and for fulfilment. You've said that a thousand times maybe. But did you know that you were saying it with that degree of passion, intention? And Jesus, having worshipped the Father, acknowledged his plan and said, your kingdom come. Now says, God, give me what I need for today. It goes on and he says, forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And this, this is what you call a conditional prayer. A conditional prayer. What's a conditional prayer? A conditional prayer is, means if you do this, I'll do that. All of us who are parents, we've sometimes said to our children, if you do this, well, I'll do that. And this is our conditional prayer. We, you have to give, you have to do in order to receive. And, and, and what does this say? Forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. In other words, if we don't forgive this, this line of this prayer that Jesus gave us, if we don't give, neither can Jesus forgive us our sins. To the degree we do, that's what Jesus will do. Forgive us our debts as we, as we forgive our debtors. It sounds awfully harsh, doesn't it? But Jesus says, what does Jesus say at another place? He says, what's the greatest commandment? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind and strength. And what's the second? Love your neighbour as yourself. That, That the love of others becomes important. Now, I've been doing ministry work for a long time and I've met people that are tragically hurt through, through struggles and difficulties in people's lives. I've met people that have been so immensely hurt. And when it comes to both things that people have done for them, and so when it comes to saying forgive people, for some people that is just so terribly hard. But, but we have to realise that forgiveness doesn't mean that we put someone back into our life necessarily who hurt us. Forgiveness means I forgive. I don't allow that ongoing hurt to hurt me. I don't allow myself to to, to hold in bitterness against that person. I don't forget what someone might have done. I don't have to put them back into into my life in the place that they were so that they could hurt me possibly again. But I am called to forgive. See, God is the provider of the grace that gets us to that place. To be honest, it's so terribly hard. What's the third petition that we see Jesus says? And Jesus says, and lead us not into temptation. And and many people get confused by this because they think to themselves, is God going to tempt us to do something wrong? Is that what's about? So God's going to tempt us uh, that we that we would enter into something that would breach his breach the kingdom of God. Uh, and well, well, if you study this, it's really far deeper. When, when we think about what God is about and the relationship God wants with us, God wants a relationship with us. God And God wants that relationship with the inside of us, with who we truly are. And, and Jesus once said that it's out of the mouth comes the intention of the heart, what we're really like. Jesus said, you know, what you say often is what's an indication of what's within, within you. Uh, Jesus is interested in the content of who you are on the inside in your heart, uh, what we're like on the inside. And so when it says, lead us not into temptation, someone wrote this and said, it means, Lord, maybe there be nothing in me that will force you to put me to the test in order to reveal what is in my heart. Again, Lord, may there be nothing in me that will force you to put me to the test in order to reveal what is in my heart. God is interested in the substance of who you are. If we have a look at the definition of integrity, what's integrity? I've often heard it said, integrity is who, you're in the da- who you are in the dark when no one's looking. What are you really like? Because we can all put on, well, our game face. We can all put on our presentation face to someone else. But what are we truly like? And, and the older I get and the longer I walk with God, 
is that I realise that the true change in me is not about my actions. It's just not. It's about what I'm like on the inside. Because who I am on the inside, in a sense, is my truest self. Until the day I die, I'll probably always mess up and do wrong things because my actions just do. I'm faulted, I'm weak, and we all are. But God's interested in the content of who we are on the inside. It's why when we read the scriptures, we read where we read Jesus talks about people who are weak, people who maybe don't do the wrong things. The, the, the people that Jesus spent so much of his time with were people that were faulted. And sometimes we can think, well, I'm only going to, it's, it's all about the good people. It's all about the people who do good, who've got it all together. But Jesus is always looking at the heart of someone, the honesty within someone. That seems to be where Jesus is most concerned. And the third prayer request that Jesus makes is this, um, but deliver us from the evil one. Deliver us from the evil one. What does the evil one mean? If you go back and you study the Latin, it's not talking about evil. It's talking here in the, in the general sense, but it's talking about Satan himself. Now, to be honest, as I've said a couple of times in recent times, the devil, Satan, well, he's out of vogue. We don't talk about him really because it makes people feel uncomfortable. Um, uh, we, we sometimes fall into the trap that, that, things, uh, that, that we think that, that the Christian life is just about all about doing our best but never recognising that the Scriptures tell us we're in this spiritual battle. Uh, we don't like to say that, that the devil is around. As it says in 1 Peter 5, 8, the devil is searching for someone and for you to devour in your life. Many, many Christians want to just live a beautiful Christian life where it's about their relationship with God. It's about prayer. It's about, uh, it's about being happy, never wanting to acknowledge that evil is about you. I, when I've been traveling and done events in different places, uh, different times people have talked to me about this. And I remember one Catholic priest came to me and he said to me, he said, Bruce, you need to remember as you do the work that you're doing. He said, what's true for you is true for everyone. You need to know that Satan hates you, that, that Satan wants you uh, to fail, that Satan is after you confronting hey that Satan hates you that Satan is after you that Satan wants you to fail uh, I don't think that kind of marries up to that whole thought of uh, of the Christian Catholic safe world that I was raised in um, this priest went on to say to me he said Satan hates your children Satan hates your reputation Satan hates your career he hates the things that are best for you because he is opposed to God who in an act of sheer goodness created you to share in his blessed life. And so, and so, so what, we, what we see in this prayer is Jesus comes along and he says is that when you pray, acknowledge God, acknowledge the plan of God. And ask that God's plan would be done on earth and ask that God's plan would be done in your life. And then he says, bring what you need for today before God. What do you need? Tell God. Forgive those who have hurt you just as God forgives all, no matter what they've done. Pray that God wouldn't have to tempt you in, in, in that sense of test you to find what is the content of your heart the substance of who you are and, and pray that evil would stay far from you, that Jesus would be the Lord and the saviour of your life. Imagine today if you belong to a community of people who loved God so much that just as a child goes to their parents and says, give me, that that Christian community was a Christian community that consistently came before God and said to God, give me because you can and I can't. I'm nothing without you. I need your help to be able to traverse and to, and to be able to negotiate through this life that we live in with all of its complexity and all of its, all of its wrong. Imagine if we became people who belonged to a community where prayer requests became the heartbeat of that prayer community. 
as they laid their needs before God, worshiping God and saying, God, you are the only one. Imagine if we prayed for a deep fervor for our families, for our children, for our grandchildren, for our spouses, for our friends, for our leaders, for our world. Imagine what the world would be like if we prayed with passion. Imagine if we prayed for peace in our world. Uh, Imagine if we prayed, as Jesus says, you can't truly be a Christian if you don't look after the poor and the weak. Imagine if we were people who prayed for them. Imagine if we stormed heaven together saying, God, your kingdom come in my life in the substance of who I am. Imagine if you placed your needs before God without apology, without saying, I'm sorry that I'm asking and believing that the miraculous power of God will work. Imagine. Well, in our ministry, people write to us all the time and people ask us to pray. And we have some people that very diligently pray and ask the Lord's blessing upon the needs that are given and sent. And I want to say to you today, if you go to this address on the screen and you write your prayer requests, there are people that will pray for you diligently, diligently, who will truly hold up your needs before God. I can't say everybody in the ministry will pray for you, but there are people that will pray for you. If you go to our prayer wall and you write your needs there, there are people all over the world that will pray for you. Now, for those of you who have that particular inclination to pray, I'm asking you, would you go to our prayer wall at this address and would you pray for people that God would work in their life, that miracles would happen in their life, that God would be present in their life. It's prayer, as someone said, that moves the hands that rule the world. It's prayer that does that. What would happen if we were that community? All of us who watch these weekend messages, all of us who watch the daily devotional messages, all of us who send in requests, what happens if we were that community of people? If it's not us, who will it be? Maybe there are others, I'm sure there are, but why not us? Why not you and I that maybe the Holy Spirit brought you to hear this message today? so that you would be someone that would pray and ask for the provision, the power and the blessing of God upon our world and upon the lives of those we love. Our world is desperate today and prayer is the answer more than anything else because prayer will lead us into the heart and to the mind and to God's will in our lives. Imagine if you had the mind of God, the heart of God, the kingdom of God surrounding you exactly in the place where you are. You would be a different person and you would help change the world. Loving Father, we thank you today that you're with us. I pray, Lord God, today that you would allow us to see that when we bring our prayer before you, we worship you because we say, God, we need you. And Lord God, if there are people today who maybe only pray when there's crises come the thing that we know that we can be confident about is you hear the prayers their prayers you hear their prayers Lord you hear the prayer of the person who's desperate who has no one else to go to you hear and Lord but equally you hear the prayers of those who come before you who work at developing a deeper and deeper a deeper relationship and open their life to your grace your ability to be who we can't be bless us today hear our prayers and Lord God as we go into the prayer wall as we send prayer requests as we share stories of your answered prayer because you are the God who does the miracles to change lives may it build our faith and cause us to bring our needs more and more and more before you. And Father, we make our prayer. We make this prayer in the name of Jesus, through the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. Today, I want to ask you for your financial support. Now, I know many people are already supporting us. What's happened at this time is that we notice at this time of the year when the seasons are changing, that it's not uncommon for us to get to a point where 
the support and financial support we have from people uh, decreases and there's a whole variety of reasons for that just the people become occupied with other things at this time I want to ask you if you would help me the point is is that we can't do this without your help I can't do it without your help the gospel if it's to go out and to reach people we need to be able to penetrate beyond the borders of our churches as I have shared on numerous occasions the story that I had with one of my brothers I was once visiting the city where he lived and he said to me, he said, how do I know when you're visiting our city to speak? And I said, oh, it's in all the church newsletters, church news bulletins, in, in the central church offices, you'll be able to find it. And I've never forgotten, he stopped because we were walking together and he paused and he said to me, I looked back, I said, what's up? And he said to me, then I'll never hear because I don't go to church. And I realise that so often when we advertise things, when we tell people about what's happening, for many of us, we're just advertising within the, within the walls of our local churches that people don't get uh, to hear about it who are outside. Many of you have written to me or told me in recent times that you don't know how you stumbled on us because you didn't hear about it in your church. As a matter of fact, many of you have said to me that you don't go to church but you found it in another way. And I, I can tell you the reason you, we, you found us is because we went looking for you. We went looking for you so that we could do what Jesus said. When Jesus said, go into whole, the whole world and proclaim the gospel. There's no doubt that we have to go beyond the borders of our church. And we need to bring the gospel, the message of Jesus to people in their homes and, in, and on their phones and on their computers. And that's what I wanna ask you with today. We are going through a very tight moment. And I'm asking if you would help me to get through this moment uh, in, in our ministry life so that we can proclaim the gospel and that we can reach people just like you, those who are very committed in church and those who found themselves not, being going, not going to church, not because of the coronavirus, but because you stopped for some reason. Now, we've had a company that have come alongside of us, another ministry that's come alongside of us, and said, whatever people contribute today, they will match. Uh, that's an amazing uh, offer. And so I'm asking, is there a way that you could help us today so that we could double whatever you contribute? To all of our faith builders, that's the people who've given over time, whether you've just given once or twice or a few times, thank you, you help make this possible. To our faith builder partners, the people with, who give regularly, whether you give $10 a month or you give a few thousand dollars a month. Uh, I want to say thank you to you. To be honest with you, in this season, you are holding us up and you're keeping us going at this moment in time. And I'm asking maybe others of you would like to become a faith builder partner and be part of this ministry in proclaiming the gospel. I can't do this without you. And today is a special day because Whatever you contribute, someone will match. How amazing is that? How gr gracious is that? And we want to pray God's blessing upon uh, those people who have offered that at this time. So I'm asking, would you help me today? I'm being very upfront, very honest about where we are. So you could, if, if you want, you can go to this address on the screen. I'd ask you to go to this address on the screen. Or you can go to the Give tab and you can give right there. And if you want to become a Faith Builder partner with a small or large, where well, we can rely on you, together we can stand, together I would be most grateful. Hey, thank you for being with us. I pray that you are blessed by today. Don't forget to go to the prayer wall. Uh, don't forget to send in your prayer requests. And I want you to know, I'll be praying. Others will be praying that God would work powerfully in your life. Hey, God bless you. See you next time. And don't forget, wherever you are, God is never far from you.